right, there we go. <laughs> Hello and welcome to uh, NFV for Enterprise. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're gonna be talking today about the role of network functions virtualization in the enterprise. We've seen a tremendous amount of interest in NFV over time. Uh, a lot of this has really started to shift towards what operators and telcos are doing in terms of where a lot of the focus is, is, has really shifted, a lot of the effort, uh, a lot of the energy. But yet there are tremendous use cases within enterprise and one of the things we're gonna explore on our panel today is where is all of this going and, and what makes sense in terms of where we are for enterprise-based NFV. Uh, let me introduce my panelists. Uh, we have, actually, we're, we're in exact order. This is awesome. Uh, Pina Dekandia uh, from Mitokura, uh, Jared Goth from Nuage, uh, Nila Jax from uh, Open, the Open Daylight Foundation uh, project, and uh, Scott Snedden from Juniper Networks. Uh, I'm Eric Anselman from uh, 451 Research. And I wanted to start today uh, by first getting a quick show of hands in terms of what your interest levels are, uh, what your focus is, and more importantly, what your experience has been. Uh, so to begin with, how many of you are focused on enterprise networks and enterprise network functionality generally? Okay. How many operators, telcos, uh, okay. service providers? Sort of traditional ISP kinds of folks, providers. Okay, so we've actually got an interesting mix really across the board here. So uh, I'd also like to figure out in terms of what you're looking for here, because we've got a lot of subject matter that we can cover. We want to ensure that we're helping answer the questions that you've come here for. So how many of you are looking to implement uh, enterprise NFV functionality today? How many of you have virtualized some components of the capabilities that you have today for firewalling, uh, load balancing, VPN capabilities today? All right, so we've got a reasonably good mix in terms of where we are. Uh, a little bit of background. How many of you are familiar with the Etsy NFV architecture? Oh, good, all right. So I think that says from where we are, we've got enough to be able to move forward uh, yeah. with a little bit of background. We've, if we need to dive into it, I've got some architecture slides that we can move to if we want some background. So uh, let me start out with that, that leading question of, so where are we in terms of NFV in the enterprise? Uh, and maybe a little background in terms of how does that reflect what's happening uh, on the carrier and operator side? Uh, and a little bit of background in terms of perspectives. I think I'd like to get something from each of you in terms of where you are. Since I'm holding the uh, electric talking stick, I'll, I'll start. So um, I, I spend my time at Juniper Networks. I, I travel around quite a bit and I talk to service providers and enterprises and I find myself when I talk to a telco uh, or, or carrier, we get into these NFV conversations. It's less about SDN and the plumbing and more about how they actually start using this in their environment. And so like what AT&T and others have been talking about this week is a good example of implementing some of these uh, NFV enabled services. But then I go talk to a, a, an enterprise and, and if it's an SDN conversation, we're talking about cloud and data center and virtualization and maybe how they move to OpenStack. But then there's always interest and it might be a sales guy trying to sell a product or, or maybe the customer has a real problem of, well, there are a lot of network administration problems in a large enterprise network with branch or, or campus or provisioning load balancers in the data center or whatever that might be. And, and so that got me thinking, what are some things we can learn from this telco NFE movement and start to apply to those use cases? And, and certainly OpenStack and others have been doing things with firewalls as a service and load balancers as a service, VPN as a service, which by the way, VPN as a service for an enterprise might mean something different than VPN as a service for a telco. But you know, are there things happening in the industry around standards and, and the Etsy reference architecture that we might be able to apply and make a bit more easy to use for, for an enterprise? Or you know, are, are, the, are the organizations in the enterprise just broken and divided so that the, the campus guys don't know or even care about what's happening in the data center? So, you know, that's, that's kind of where my thinking has been lately, and, and I'm, I just wanted to sort of explore what's possible and how we can start to align some of these activities. Cool. Well, to add to that, you know, what I would say is when you say enterprise, the first question is, who do you mean? 
Because if I'm, uh, a few years ago, I went to Nebraska and went to the Nebraska Furniture Mart. They're an enterprise. They're pretty big concern. They have lots of IT. Their needs are fundamentally different from Thomson Reuters, United Airlines, Baidu, and a few others. And so when I look at it, I think that there's almost three categories of companies out there. There are the carriers who are service providers, and the network isn't just important to them. The network is their business. On the other extreme, there are people for whom the network is one of 10 things in IT. It's important, it's there, but honestly, it's not the, uh, the top concern. For those people, honestly, my experience is NFE and even to some extent SDN is nowhere in those companies unless they have a very specific use case that necessitates it. It is, the interesting part is really in between, because if you look at someone like United Airlines, you might think the network matters because that's how you book your ticket. However, when they misconfigure a switch and the network goes down, planes don't take off, right? So it really makes you think about how important is the network to a company that you wouldn't think that the network is part of, uh, of what they do. When you think of someone like Thomson, uh, Thomson Reuters, again, while they're not a service provider in the way you might normally think about it, again, if the network goes down, they're no longer able to sell what they have. So you've got the network isn't their business, but it is tightly coupled to their business. And this is where I think that we're seeing the most interesting cases of NFE, is it, uh, NFE in enterprises. There are some critical differences, but this middle group has the scale by which it makes sense to invest in, uh, in being able to change the way that you do things, to invest in the DevOps uh, mentality that you need, to invest in open communities, which is a little bit harder. And I think as we talk more, um, when I'm talking about enterprise, most of the time I'm really talking about that middle, uh, that middle segment. I would agree. I think that's a very good way of, of uh, kind of segmenting the discussion because uh, I certainly agree that, that you have, uh, a, uh, there's a group in enterprise for which this is, is very relevant. And, and I spend most of my time uh, with um, a good set of enterprise customers that fit into that category. And I would say that from what I see, majority of the time, it's uh, how do I virtualize the firewall? How do I virtualize the load balancer? And my two main concerns in doing that are, uh, actually probably the, the, the biggest concern there is um, I want to get away from large appliances where change can, you know, configuration management, uh, change windows are incredibly complicated. So if I can break this up uh, and I can simplify that and I can do things on a per business unit basis or a per application basis, my life uh, as a network engineer uh, becomes a lot simpler, right? So um, what I see so far is the NFV use cases are fairly narrow. Um, and furthermore, within sort of a, a more of a narrow set of enterprise customers. So we at Midokura mostly deal with enterprises and public cloud providers. And like Scott said, most of what we see is, um, and, and I'm not, I hesitate to call it uh, um, network function virtualization, but we see a lot of LBAS and firewall as a service and VPN as a service. Now, I don't qualify these as um, NFV because they have their own interfaces. They have very um, use case specific ways of, of dealing with them. Um, yes, the virtual appliances, but, um, but basically customers can interact with them directly. They insert them into the virtual topology directly. So they don't, they don't share a service chaining approach or we haven't, certainly haven't taken that approach until now, although there's discussion of doing that. Um, and therefore, the way they're managed is also from an administrative standpoint, they're managed directly by the user. They're not inserted and managed by a different level uh, of administrator. So those, those use cases, and I'd be, I'd be really curious to hear what the audience thinks about those as a service uh, functions if, if they count for as NF, NFV. What we're seeing more recently is in the security domain, that's a, that's a, there's a case where there really is network function virtualization. So, uh, so Mirakura has, a, has a, a partnership with, with Intel. Intel has an open security controller, which is an orchestrator so an NFE orchestrator, but specialized for, uh, for security. And in that space, um, so it, it's, it's doing all of the things that the, the Etsy architecture requires, but it's, it's, it's orchestrating appliances, and it's not a generic orchestrator. Now, what I find interesting is we're just getting started in terms of where do you place the appliances? At what granularity can you launch the appliances? What happens if you have a lot of different policies or a lot of different appliances you want to launch? Um, the questions that come up are things like where do you where do you place? How many instances do you place? Is the latency uh, tolerable if I have to go off box to reach the network function uh, virtualization? 
Um, so I think for, for, from our viewpoint, we see a lot of uh, the question of NFE for enterprise being around security. Key points. Uh, it sounds like what I'm taking away from what each of your positions are is that enterprise really winds up being this subset of a lot of the things that operators are considering in a lot of these projects uh, that are looking at, at much greater scale. Um, so yes or no from each of you is that, is this just a subset or is this an automation problem? I mean, what's, it's what I heard each of you saying is that enterprises are only tackling small pieces of this and probably not at the scale. Um, uh, uh, that, I'll, I'll jump it right in and yet. say, so, so um, probably a smaller set of requirements, maybe, because the use cases are more narrow, but uh, not, in, not entirely a subset. I mean, you're calling and out that the firewalling and, and load balancing is not really uh, an NFE because it's typically existed in its own appliance. So right. uh, is that something where enterprise so I think, I think just one, isn't ready? Well, one thing we'll see, I think, is that all of the techniques and the, and the technologies that we see being pushed by the telcos, those will, will help. So um, um, pinning to cores, uh, all, the, all the modifications we need to do to the appliances and to the SDNs to make packets flow faster. That, that, that's shared across the two use cases. Um, one thing I'll sort of throw out there that I think will help both communities and is not being done very much is um, uh, true virtualization of the appliances is, is, is not being done. So the, 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 the appliances are too big. And, and therefore, you, you, you have to be very careful about where you deploy them, how many, uh, how many do you deploy. You might have to go off box if you can't afford well, the course. And to your point, management is going to be done independently of the rest of the network infrastructure. It's not going to be deployed as part of that. Um, I don't know, Scott, I see you nodding vigorously. Is that... Uh... I, yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly where I was going with this and thinking about it. Um, I mean, right now what we're seeing when we virtualize a, a network function is that somebody took that big firewall and then feature for feature, function for function, tried to squeeze it into a virtual machine. And, and it that, sounds like from our audience, that's probably what a lot of you are doing out there in yeah, terms of virtualization. You have a that, virtual edition, you've got those pieces. That, that works well, that has its application. What we're seeing a lot of conversations happening in, in the telco space is, yeah, there's a lot of development around pinning to cores and using SRIOV and DPDK to make that thing faster and faster, but then it's sort of starting to look like that big box again because I, instead of a, you know, branded box from one of us, now I have a Intel box, but that's all it's going to do is that function because I'm locking that thing down. I, I think what we're starting to see a lot of interest in is more of a cloud native architecture for these network functions. And instead of having one thing with one core moving packets at 10 or 20 gig, we're going to have a distributed architecture that's load sharing across many, many cores that might spread out across the data center. And then that becomes an orchestration problem, a resource management problem that looks like cloud native. As the NFV ecosystem evolves to that, as the management tools move away from managing my load balancer to managing my distributed application, there's probably a lot that we can apply to these enterprise use cases just from that development and learning. Well, so is this a matter of the enterprise application architectures really being built for an expectation of there will be boxes or you know, virtualized concepts of boxes as opposed to being able to break apart a lot of the functionality and distribute it along with the application? I mean, that's, I think, to your point, the orchestration pieces start to become that bigger aspect. Yeah, yeah and again, I think you have to, there is no one enterprise. There's a big range of them. Um, and I think one of the differences I've seen in enterprises in general versus service providers is service providers are quickly realizing that having a siloed infrastructure doesn't make sense, right? People trying, uh, in the early days, you build up OpenStack on ML2, right? And that was your cloud and you had your network and those two teams were completely different teams and you bought different solutions from both and you had uh, different books for how to, uh, to manage them. And you know, if you've been walking around any of these sessions, what you find is that the AT&Ts of the world, but even the much smaller ones, are realizing that they need to bring this together. And that SDN and NFV aren't two separate things that happen to share one letter, um, that they really need to work together. And it is about, all of this is about making our network more programmable. And having a more agile, more programmable network is really important in managing your network backbone. It's really important, obviously, if you're doing cloud. Um, and therefore, these are all tools and techniques that you're doing together. And the question is, how do you lower complexity? How do you get out of siloed approaches where different teams are doing different things and try and have one way? 
I think that the same, we're seeing the same thing with the larger, more sophisticated enterprises. It's probably a, a year or two behind. You ask this question about, is it a subset? In some sense, yes. I mean, it's clear that something like Evolve Packet Core does not apply to enterprises. So there are whole parts of NFV you can slice off and say, no nope. No IMS gateways, you know. Th th that doesn't, on the other hand, there's things, I was just recently at Baidu in uh, just outside of Beijing, and if you haven't had a chance to look into what these uh, second generation Chinese uh, internet companies are doing, it'll blow your mind. All white box, 90,000 ODM white box top of rack switches across 30 data centers, and they're, they're building a second generation network. They're taking what they learned from what Google did and they're building their own using open source components, getting support and help. And so I'm seeing, and it's not just them, a lot of these enterprises for whom the network is strategic are doing really, really interesting things. Um, Tencent is doing BGP route optimization all the way down to their best, best customers. These are things that you've never seen. A service provider actually owns the route to the customer, so it's not relevant for them. So I actually think what we're talking about is a Venn diagram. There is a set of things that are common for the most advanced enterprises and for service providers. And there are some things that advanced enterprises do that service providers don't do, and there are things that service providers will do that advanced enterprises won't do. I guess I would maybe call it trickle-down NFV. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening <laughs> at the telecom layer and operator layer that enterprises will be able to cherry pick as it becomes mature and as the use cases present, prevent, or present themselves. So. I think it's all good. I mean, I think it's all great. I think the majority of enterprises, even the sophisticated ones, um, this isn't the only thing they're working on, right? They've got a ton of stuff to do. And to get involved heavily at this time, I think is probably more than they're willing to invest. So uh, how does that trickle down actually take place? Uh, what's that consumption model? Uh, is that something where the platforms that they're working with? Is that something where you start looking at the virtualization platform, a, a networking manage, or a networking layer, which you know, the two of you have certainly yeah. got a vested interest in? I guess in. I would say I, I'm not sure yet. Uh, I, I think it's potentially a little too early to tell what that really looks like. Uh, I do think that there are elements of this, maybe security and others, that will get picked up by folks like Nuage, Mitakura, that are providing the, the networking fabric, the plumbing. I think there are functions that are, are very logical to be brought into that type of uh, that type of technology, um, but I, I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I have an answer for it yet. I think it's still pretty early in terms of what's happening at the the operator layer, and I think there's also potential for operators themselves to provide that functionality as a service to the yeah, end customer. One. Right? Yeah, They're going to take. Part of the they'll take on the complexity. Gets integrated into right. The they'll take the complexity and present the service. Maybe I'll add a little bit to that. Um, my view is that. Yes, some of the technology will trickle down from the telco to the enterprise, but I think the enterprise will really take a different, a different approach. So the, um, the generalized uh, orchestrator for your network functions, I don't see as much value in, in, in the enterprise. I think the enterprise, by and large, wants very clear models uh, to do things like load balancing and firewalling and, 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 uh, and, and layer seven firewalling and IPS, IDS. Um, <laughs> So, and I think we've already built these. So what I mean is, the enterprise wants an OpenStack project. Now, is that project, uh, and that project should be very specific to its use case. Now, is that project something on top of, of, uh, of Tacker, you know, the, the, the network function virtualization that we have today that's generic? But I think that that, that specialization layer is really important. Um, the other side is um, the, you know, in my mind, the, the what, what does network function virtualization mean? I mean, what are the problems that are different in network function virtual, virtualization versus network virtualization? We've been virtualizing um, BGP for a while. It's a control plane function. I don't really think of it as network function virtual, virtualization because we don't chain it. We don't, uh, we don't have the performance uh, problems there. Um, but you might think it, it's, I mean, after all, it is a, a virtualized router, so, or, or virtualized router, router control plane. Um, but I think the really hard problems in uh, NFV are the performance problems, the, the, the placement and, and lifecycle management problems, and then that, that layer of 
of glue, not just to deploy, but also how do you configure? And so configuring the load balancer or the, the, the software load balancing instances inside the load balancer, um, coordinating with the clustering technology in, in, your, in, in a distributed VPN, for example. All of these are very specific and will require very specific APIs for the callbacks. So you, know, you, you, you configure your policy in, in, in your network function, and then you configure the service chaining, and the service chaining might, need, you might use load balancing. And, and so the interactions will be very different if you're using load balancing or if you're not. Well, but that starts to get back to uh, that narrowed use case of the operator model. Because if you have to do the service chaining, if you've got to stitch all of these things together as part of the orchestration, you're now starting to do all of the pieces that the operator has to do, right? Right. right. And, and actually, I wanted to get another quick show of hands. Um, you called out one of the projects for management of, of the actual NFE instances themselves. How many of you are using Tacker currently? Well, actually, let me start out. How many of you are aware of Tacker? Two term? Oh, good. All right. So we're reasonably good shape. But, but even with Tacker, what you've got is the environment that's going to help you manage what that instance is. You can hopefully keep it up and running. You can do configuration management. You can do some definition around it. But it's not going to do that stitching of the data flows to be able to pull that together. Um, there's additional integration that has to happen to make that work. Is that a level of complexity that's beyond the range of, of a typical enterprise? Uh, and Neil, I think for you, in terms of the, the ODL side of things, you know, that's really the focus of where a lot of the interconnection has to get done. What's that level of integration and orchestration that you see on the, the enterprise side? Has the enterprise gotten smart enough more broadly? Uh, and again, with whatever those definitions of enterprise you want to head towards? Sure. Um, I mean, I think in general, one of the things that I see in enterprises is um, Enterprises have a tendency to look for more complete, more packaged solutions. So to your point, the ability of most enterprises to invest in an open platform early, just it isn't there. Part of it, it may be because of scale, it may be resources, it may be, it may be focused. And so it's actually not surprising to me that you, know, you saw enterprises uh, go towards VMware before OpenStack, where you saw some of the large operators, some of the web scale guys go do that. We see the same thing in SDN and NFV, which is to the extent that some of the other people here on my panel can come in and say, here's a very specific defined problem that you have. I'm going to come in and deliver a solution to it. That's very attractive. And compare that to, hey, there's, there's this broad community out there, whether it's OpenStack, Open Daylight, oven, whatever you want, tacker, whatever you want to look at it, and hey, go get educated, go find out. There's a wonderful community of people who will support you, but just know that you need to do some level of self-support. That's a lot harder for, for an enterprise side. So I think we're going to see the same thing here that we see with any kind of standardization project. Um, at first, people need to invent the technology. And so you get a lot of people who create a technology and just deliver it and make it work. After a while, what you find is there are many different flavors of it, and there's a cost to, being, uh, to having a whole set of technologies. You can't test across all of them. So there becomes a desire for a standard. It either comes through standardization, and there's one way of doing things, and people align to that, or it comes around a standard platform that everybody uh, can connect to. I personally, obviously, I'm sitting here thinking, uh, I'm sitting here because I believe that we need a, a Linux for networking. Whether you're looking at NFV or SDN, we need a common platform. And that a lot of these things right now that are integrated end-to-end -end solutions will simply become applications that run into the platform. That's certainly true around OpenStack on the compute side. I certainly believe that it's necessary on the networking side also. All right, I want to actually dig into that in a little more detail, but I also want to make sure that we leave time for questions. So if you have questions, if anyone has a question at this point, We have microphones over on the side. Uh, if you've got, uh, but let's dig into some of this, but if things are coming up, keep those in mind. Uh, is there a point at which these requirements start to converge? And Neil, you were talking about that sort of shift of some of those capabilities moving into applications sitting on top of those platforms. Um, but those kind of sorts of transitions are still a ways off. Um, where does that fit? And actually, Scott, I wanted to sort of get some of your perspectives on I, I, yeah, I mean, um, it's the, the trickle-down NFE is a really good way to look at it. I think, um, you know, the requirements are still kind of being understood in the telco space, and, and but they're the ones that are investing heavily in, in developing those requirements and the solutions. Um, I sat in a, a, a BOF session yesterday of, of the um, OPNFE and, and OpenStack 
teams talking about cross collaboration and cross team participation. I think that drives some development into OpenStack and OpenStack becomes a more consumable platform for these things and, and maybe some of the things we we're talking about here become an inherent part of the, the Linux for networking or they become an inherent part of, of OpenStack and then you know, whether or not the, the, the consumer intended to deploy NFV, there is a component in OpenStack that they're just gonna use automatically. And so maybe that's where these things start to come in to be, to be used. Um, but yeah, it's, as with any you know, vendor or solution developer in this space, it's, it's use case driven. And so far, we're not totally understanding all those use cases. We think there are a few, with firewall and load bouncer and, and things like that for sure, but yeah. Well, and yeah. I guess from my standpoint is that it may be too early to be pushing for convergence or looking for convergence, that we need to actually explore the use cases a lot more. And it's okay if we have several projects that uh, have some, some similarity in terms of how they're, they're managing some, some uh, virtualized function. Um, the, uh, you know, I think, I think Tacker is very interesting because it's, it has taken that kind of gen general approach of, of, of being uh, a platform for any network function, and, and it'll be interesting to see how folks can actually take that and use it. And it's better, I'll say it's better, and, and by the way, I'll mention again, open, uh, Intel's Open Security Controller is um, an open platform, so any IPS can go into that, and that's already there for IPSs. Now, for those other use cases, it'll be interesting to see if people can take Tacker and modify it for their use case. And I was gonna say that it was be it's better than what was happening before. We were having conversations with vendors often where we'd say, uh, they'd ask, okay, so what, your SDN overlay base, that's great. Um, can you do service chaining so that we can service chain the, the appliance? Okay, yes, great, we can. Um, can you do bump in the wire or routed? And we talk, routed model, we talk about that. Um, okay, so who's going to do the, the orchestration? And the vendor says, well, we build uh, this, this network function. That's our specialization. We're not an or we, don't, we don't build orchestration. And likewise, from our standpoint, we build software-defined networking. We want to move packets. We want to provide uh, connectivity and policy. And the orchestration of, of, of uh, VMs or containers, um, that, that's, not our, that, that's not our problem. I mean, we, we do that maybe for BGP, right? I have to move my BGP containers around. I might have a VPN appliance I, I move around, maybe a load balancer. But for the more complex service graphs, whose semantics I don't understand. That's, that's something that where, where that was just, and therefore the customer would have to build a set of scripts that were just useful for their use case, not really shareable. It ties into their integration points somewhere around the orchestration. Uh, Jared, in terms of that, that orchestration integration, what are your thoughts about sort of where they fit um, and what those integration points are for that broader orchestration environment? Well, it, it, I would agree with Pino that, that that's definitely where the conversations are going for, for some of these specific functions, right? So uh, from a nuage perspective, we can do that same type of, of service chaining function, but then it gets into, all right, that's great. You've got that part. Um, who's the vendor that has the other part, right? And then where do those two meet? Um, I think there was at least early on some hope that OpenStack would be that place where things would meet. And I think there's still potential for that to happen. Um, uh, or it's just going to be the fact that you know we're an open solution with with open APIs and the 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 service function you know uh, per, um, vendor has the same thing and and customers are becoming more savvy the skill sets are changing uh, so that they are able to look at that and go yeah I can make those two talk together that's fine I'll take that on um, so I think there's a there's a spectrum. Um, I would certainly hope that it, it moves towards something like OpenStack or some of these other platforms that would standardize it a bit more uh, so that it is easier for vendors to interoperate. Uh, it's easier from a support perspective. Um, you know, there's a lot that's technically possible uh, from an enterprise customer perspective. The question is who's gonna support it, right? When something goes bang in the middle of the night, who do I call, how do I fix it? You know, who's on the hook for it? There's a lot about that job that's about risk mitigation. Um, so it's important to have frameworks to do this, um, and I think there's there's certainly some some potential within OpenStack to be that or some of the projects inside of it. Cool. Thoughts for any of the rest of you guys? Oh, we had, sorry, we had a question. I was. Um, this is Nadan from Red Hat. Um, had a question about the uh, you know where we stand from a global perspective. Uh, so yes, AT and T Verizon was mentioned. I was also interested in. The trip to China and that perspective, but overall, from you know EMEA and different countries around the world, 
um, what's the, where do we stand? You know, are enterprises out there beyond North America? How, how ready are they or are they ready? Very interested in your, the panel's perspective on that. I'll start with some data um, from an open daylight perspective, and this crosses SDN and NFE, but um, when we went in and we looked, we found that there's almost even usage of open daylight across three of the five major regions in the world. So if you look at the Americas, certainly, um, like you said, there is a lot of usage. Um, however, I see Asia and Europe roughly about the same. Europe tends to be slightly smaller right now. Asia has been, it's probably the fastest growing, but across those three, the two areas you just see the least is actually in Africa and in, in South America. So I, I would say in general, that's what you're saying now. I will point out a, a couple other things. In the United States, we tend to have larger organizations. So on average, um, I tend to see in, uh, in the US, we tend to be a little bit ahead, um, and this is true across a lot of areas of uh, technology. In China, you have a lot more greenfield. So one of the advantages that you're getting in China, especially on uh, other parts of Asia, is because you're having so much build out, right? You're going from 100 million users to 800 million users within a couple of years. Um, that allows you potentially to do some new things, and you've got, you know, you walk around Baidu, the average age is something like 24. You walk around AT&T, and it's not 24. Um, and so John Donovan stands up on stage and says, hey, we're going to virtualize 75%. A big part of him saying that is not for the outside audience, it's for the inside audience to get them to change and move. In a place like Baidu, you know, five years ago they were in high school, most of those kids. And so learning something new is what they do every, every day anyway. And so, I, you know, I, I, I think that there are some of those differences. Field, What's but, that? But you, to that green field, I, mean, I take a look at a lot of our research, absolutely mirroring the same things but that sophistication of orchestration and who can actually start to consume that also has got a really broad driver. You get Western Europe uh, and the Nordic countries that are starting to do a lot of adoption or have already done a lot of orchestration adoption just simply because they've invested early on, not so much in North America, and greenfield opportunities, uh, China leading, but throughout Asia. So, yeah. Uh, we have another question I want to make sure we have time for. Thanks, Eric. Scott Fulton from the New Stack. Uh, one of the things I've heard uh, more than once at the conference here, and, I, and I've, I've heard it uh, again in another form here, uh, is the theme that if you don't have homogeneity in the platform, you can't scale it. Neela has talked about uh, asking the question, what kind of enterprise are you, in order to, to, to be able to determine what fits for your enterprise and how NFV applies to you. Well, if we end up with a situation where we have NFV and other characteristics applying to different enterprises in different levels or different respects, then don't we uh, create a situation where, where small businesses cannot suddenly become Baidu, if you will. They, they're not homogenous enough to be able to scale up when it's ready for them to scale up because their resources are rooted to a different way of business. And I think to Neela's point, you wind up having a set of different consumption models mm -hmm. that for those smaller businesses, yes. you wind up having integrated platform capabilities that are gonna handle that. Um, eventually, for a lot of those organizations, it winds up being somebody else's capability through a service provider in some mm -hmm. form or fashion. It's when you start moving up the stack that you now change what those consumption capabilities are. And I think that some of everybody's been talking about sort of which of those pieces of the puzzle of uh, individual types of organizations are actually able to absorb. You know, who's able to pick up Tacker today, do all the stitching necessary to make that work? You've got to be pretty high functioning um, in terms of the capabilities that, that exist with other different options. Um, there are a whole bunch of different choices, but uh, uh, this sounds like something that's useful to close on in terms of what those consumption models are and where we go. I'm going to give each of you a, a last shot at what that looks like. All right. Um, <laughs> I was preparing to, to answer the, the previous oh, well, well, question. The, the, um, <laughs> let, me, let me just add really quickly about the point of um, scaling only if you have homogeneity. So there are various layers at which um, you can have homogeneity, homogeneity, and it's not always the case that an enterprise wants homogeneity because they're trying out lots of use cases, and sometimes they need to build out various use cases as they learn 
what the right platform is. We're seeing a bunch of experimentation with container orchestration uh, models, for example. And so I think we see, even in the same enterprise, multiple platforms, uh, heterogeneity, and then, the, and then, you know, as much as it's painful, eventually they try to make those converge as they need to over time because uh, of the efficiencies they need to grow. So maybe homogeneity is a property that you end up picking up as you scale and not necessarily having to start out with when you're experimenting. Um, to your point about, uh, your question about consumption models, um, how about I pass it and I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Does anyone have a ready answer? Do you want to pick up the last question? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, I hadn't... Yeah. So you're blinded by the light, so uh, please. Hi. So a question. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about micro-segmentation, which is the act of inserting virtual firewalls or routers between different components of an application. So do you see that taking off? Do you see end-user demand as opposed to vendors is talking about it? And uh, can you talk more about that, please? I, I mean, this is one of the gr really great use cases that's driving virtualizing those network functions, right? As my security perimeter changes, I by necessity have to apply security policy at a different level. And that's what gets us into micro-segmentation. Microservices drive micro-segmentation requirements. And so, um, yeah, a lot of development around where I apply and how I apply security policy um, certainly drives products and, and solutions onto the market that answer that. So, right. yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely one of the leading things. It's not just firewall as a service. It's how I actually apply that security policy. And it could be a firewall or it could be in, in another way, or a combination of ACLs and firewalls and, and other policies. And, and actually, I think you're touching on what is a, a good point of, of distinction there, which is what is that function, which would be sort of higher order processing like a firewall, versus just raw segmentation, which is access control and hard limits that, that don't necessarily have any sentience about the tra traffic it's going through. Micro segmentation, absolutely critical, um, but something that you can do through partitioning of the environment as opposed to higher level functions that have to manage complex conversations or, or other capabilities beyond that. But. I wanted to actually start by answering the question that you asked, which is around consumption models. And for a second, I'm gonna change hats. Um, as executive director, I'm also a CIO. Um, and I face this question in that we use a lot of infrastructure. And in fact, we started building our own OpenStack cloud at the Linux Foundation. Um, and at some point I found, we, like many CIOs in the world, my infrastructure wasn't meeting the needs of the business. In my case, I had developers creating new tests and it, it took a lot of time. So I went to Rackspace and I said, hey Rackspace, can you take that problem off, off, uh, off my plate? Initially went to their public cloud, now we're on their private cloud. And I think you know, what this illustrates for me is from a consumption model, um, you really have to ask yourself this question. Is my infrastructure, is my network critical to my business? If it is critical and strategic and you must own it, then you must think about how am I going to go towards a platform strategy? It's fine in the short term to go in and buy point solutions to solve point problems, but you incur integration debt when you go there. And so you either pay for it upfront or you pay for it long term. And so for those for whom it's strategic, yes, you want to get engaged in platform. If the platform's not quite ready for your needs, it's a strategic investment. You invest a little bit. You understand that point solutions are short term options and either they'll work onto your chosen platform or be replaced within three to five years. So that's one side. Of it. At the other extreme, you talked about the small company. I think the right answer in most cases is go find someone to take the problem off your plate. So that may be Amazon Web Services, it may be AT&T, it may be Verizon, it may be Rackspace, right? And, and it's interesting, it's not that Open Daylight or the Linux Foundation does not have technical talent. We certainly do. I would just rather have my staff be thinking about other things rather than getting OpenStack up and running and adding more, uh, adding more memory to, to scale it out. I'm happy to write a check to to take that off my plate, even if we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, so that I can focus my resources on really delivering the new continuous integration tests for my developers, because I'm not in the business of running infrastructure. I'm in the business of actually creating an infrastructure in my case. And so I really think that there are sort of those three levels. You can either on one extreme try and manage it yourself and it better be strategic. You can go buy a set of point solutions from people and probably it's an in-between uh, in between solution, or you can go outsource and find someone for whom it is strategic and then really hold them to, are you meeting my business needs and do it? So that's my view on where I think consumption models are going. And Jared, we will leave you with the final word. <laughs> All right, I'm between you guys and lunch. Um, 
I would totally agree. I mean, I think we've seen this with a number of other technologies as well, right? There's kind of a bell curve. Um, there are people at the one end that uh, have the technical talent. It, things are strategic. There are the folks on the other end that need to focus resources in other places, and so they'll outsource. Uh, so I, I totally agree with that. I think that, that that's where it's going to go. What it looks like in each of those areas, I think there's room for growth, and I would say we're still probably pretty early on in what those consumption models really look like. Uh, I think they're going to evolve in each of those categories. But, uh, and, but I'm encouraged by all the, the, the work that's being done, uh, the more that I think it, it can be done out in the open. Uh, in open source communities and open source frameworks, I think does encourage uh, folks to get involved and to, to provide input and feedback, and I, th and I think that's really important. Great. Well, we'll watch this space and see how things develop. So would you join me I, in I disagree, but there's no time. The what? I disagree, I disagree <laughs> but there's no <laughs> oh. um, No, no, I, 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 yeah, we'll take it outside. Oh, all right. No, no, maybe, maybe I, I would just say that um, <laughs> it, if, if people tolerate me for just one, one second, I, I don't agree with this approach that you can just say, well, just you know, take the problem off my hands. I mean, you often are trying to move faster than the public cloud provider, and you'd be at the public cloud, cloud provider if you could put your data there, or if they had the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the requirements, the features that you're looking for. So often the customers are looking for something that's not being done yet. The platform isn't really mature enough, so they have to get, uh, you know, they have to commit to a platform that is still changing very rapidly. Um, so ideally, Nila, I think that, that you know, your strategy is good, good business logic. But in practice today, people are having to cobble together solutions with, uh, with platforms that are, that are great, that have made tremendous strides, but actually need a lot more maturity. Cool. Well, with that, we will leave it. <laughs> Once again, to join me in, welcome, uh, in thanking our panelists, uh, thank you very much for attending today. Thank you.